Good evening, everyone. My name is Curtis Nall, Superintendent of Conroe ISD. Thanks for joining us tonight for our February 2023 update. For those of you that have been with us uh, throughout these live updates over the last few years, you know that they have morphed and changed as the needs have changed for our community. So tonight we try something new. We're going to try to compact this a little bit more uh, and give you more information in a shorter amount of time. And perhaps we'll do these even more often. You know, during COVID, we had a lot of emotions to work through, and so it was important to do these live and to really be able to talk through our decisions and, and help you see and know the struggles that we were dealing with. But today, uh, as we've found a little bit more of a rhythm and we're back to normal, uh, we're going to try this new format. Hopefully, it'll work for everyone. And if you're new to these, the, the point uh, of having these conversations rather than just sending an email is to help you see um, that why. Um, that we make the decisions that we make. So uh, let me start with just Happy New Year. Well, it's been a while as I started preparing for uh, tonight's event uh, to see that we haven't spoken to each other in 2023. So I wish you all a Happy New Year. I hope you had a wonderful holiday. And we are excited to be back in school with so many great things going on. Uh, you know, this is a busy time of year and I don't know what's not a busy time of year anymore. I was uh, at an event today and someone asked me, is, is this your busy time of year? And I said, well, yes it is. But so was November and December and August and May. And so I think for all of us, the world has, has sped back up and as things have reopened, which we appreciate and we're getting back to normal, uh, we also feel that stress and strain of being pulled in a million different directions. But for us in the school business, uh, we're being pulled to a lot of great events. Uh, we've had an uh, outstanding start of 2023. It started really with our science fair. The Conroe ISD Science Fair is one of the largest science fairs in the state of Texas. Um, you could see here uh, that we have great competition that occurs at the Lone Star Convention Center of our junior high and high school students. Uh, our students then advance from this competition to the Houston area competition and from there onto state, national and world competition. But in addition to the traditional science fair competition that you think of, we also have a science festival which is an outstanding event. And if you haven't had a chance to go to that, I encourage you next year uh, to pay attention to the calendar and find a way to go out and bring your young ones to that event. This year's event happened at College Park High School. And as you can see here, so many people out on a Saturday morning, kids having fun learning about science. So that's something that we love um, and we appreciated the opportunity to have that event. In addition to that, uh, as we've started this new year, we are uh, out on campuses delivering what we call ambassador awards. Uh, I get to go out to the campus. I bring with me board members. Uh, it's great to have them on campus as well. And we recognize at each campus, a teacher, a paraprofessional and a student. They're selected by the campus and, and we read a nice uh, tribute to them and tell them why they were selected and we get the honor of taking pictures with them. So it's just one more way to say thank you for people doing great work and being great examples. And uh, I encourage you to find those posts on social media. You're gonna see people that you know and love and, and let's leave you know very nice comments for them and help them to feel good and celebrate them as well. Now, TMEA is another event that occurs and uh, you know, it wouldn't be education if we didn't have an acronym. Uh, TMEA stands for the Texas Music Educators Association Convention. That occurs each year in San Antonio here in February. Uh, tens of thousands of people, music educators from across the state, uh, kind of converge on San Antonio and there are multiple purposes. One is professional development for our music educators. So we have many of our uh, teachers there and they get great professional development. But two, students that have earned the distinction of being an all-state musician, they go and, and they participate uh, in uh, workshops and prepare for concerts that occur there. And then third, uh, as you see in these pictures, we have performing groups that actually perform during uh, the convention for all the teachers that are present. This year, we had Collins Intermediate uh, the choir performed and you could see these great pictures that's a big room for a group of intermediate students that performed to uh, they did an absolutely beautiful job uh, it is my honor each year to go to san antonio and, and be there to celebrate with our performing groups because it is a difficult task to be chosen uh, to perform 
uh, groups from all across the state uh, vie for that uh, honor. And I'm proud that each year Conroe ISD has had someone uh, get the distinction of performing at TMEA. So congratulations to Collins. Thanks for letting me be a part of that day. Uh, it truly was very special. Now, looking forward, the, the busy times don't stop, right? We, we celebrated last weekend. We had uh, the Black History Parade here up here in Conroe. Looking ahead to this next weekend, we have the Go Texan Parade. Uh, there are parades and galas and activities all across our community. Here we are. It's basketball playoff time. It's wrestling. Now advancing past uh, district competition into regionals and state. We wish them the very best. Swimming also advancing now into state competition you have baseball softball track getting started soccer wrapping up uh, their season going to be looking uh, into post district play here very soon so there are a lot of opportunities for you out there to get involved in your community go out and see our kids in action uh, in addition to all the great fine arts performances and academic competitions that, that will be occurring um, over these next few months so i encourage you to get out see the great things that are going on in our campuses we have a lot to be proud of here in conroe ISD uh, and appreciate everybody's work uh, that gives our students these opportunities. Now, we've talked a lot about this year about two things. We've talked about safety and we've talked about growth. And I want to circle back to safety a little bit. I was looking at my notes from uh, our last conversation in December and there were a few things that we mentioned that I just want to bring back up to you uh, today. And then I want to add a few more for you to think about as parents because safety is not something that we as a staff can uh, do alone, nor can kids do it alone, or nor can parents do it alone. It takes all of us working together to make sure that our students and our campuses are safe each and every day. First thing I want to mention to you is about fentanyl. Uh, it is an epidemic in our country. It's something that we want to keep all of our students safe. It, it's uh, running rampant in the community, not just our community, but in the nation. And you know, we need to make sure we're having real honest conversations with our children about not ingesting things that we do not know what it is because it just takes one situation with fentanyl to find yourself in a very tough spot. Uh, along with that is vaping. Uh, vaping is very unsafe. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of kids feel like it is um, less harmful for them than smoking, so we see more and more students doing that than we did uh, than we saw with just traditional smoking of cigarettes. But we know that vaping has very negative impacts. Additionally, those vape cartridges, we don't know exactly what's in them. And there are times when even fentanyl can find its way into those vape cartridges. So we need to have real conversations with our kids about that as well. We also talked um, back in December about not bringing uh, inappropriate items to school. And we run into that each and every day on one of our campuses where students bring something that they shouldn't have brought uh, more times than not or almost all the time they don't mean harm by it uh, they just forgot to take out maybe their hunting supplies from their backpack or uh, you know a very young child just thought something you know maybe a, a utensil from the kitchen was a was a cool thing to bring to show their friends not realizing that uh, that could cause alarm for people so uh, let's make sure we have conversations, not just with our older kids, but even our younger kids about, you know, we don't take things to school unless mom and dad know exactly what you're taking. So that gives you that opportunity uh, to make sure that it's appropriate for them. Also, social media posts. Social media certainly can have its positive place in this world, but it can be a negative. Uh, students have to understand that making threats or threatening comments on social media can have very real consequences, not only just school consequences, but perhaps in the legal system as well. When you make a threat against a school, it is never, it's something that we never take lightly. Uh, we're always going to fully investigate and we're also going to fully prosecute when, when that's appropriate. So we want to make sure our schools are safe. Please make sure that your child's not the one that gets caught in that situation of saying inappropriate things on social media that could create panic uh, in one of our schools. And finally, I, I think we all need, maybe we all need this reminder, not just kids, but um, respect and kindness go a long way. And as we you know, move into the springtime, we need to remind our students uh, about being respectful of themselves and others. That includes the teachers, but also other classmates uh, and being kind to each other. 
uh, we begin to see a ramp up of behaviors that we wish we would not see on campuses, including uh, and leading up to verbal altercations that then sometimes turn into physical altercations. And certainly when you have a school, be it a junior high, a high school with thousands of kids present, we can't have a society that turns to physical violence. Uh, that does not work. And so there are severe consequences when students do that, and, and there must be and there will continue to be. So um, please talk to your, your students about that. We wanna make sure that we're keeping everybody safe on campus. And I'm gonna transition now and talk a little bit about transportation, but I wanna to stick to where to what we were talking about with behavior, because uh, I'm gonna invite Mr. McCord to join me here. Uh, Chris McCord, you've had a chance to meet him uh, numerous times. He's our Assistant Superintendent for Operations. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, I wanna start with behavior. Yes. Because we, we, it's important that we have great behavior in the schools. That's critical. We can't learn if we, if we don't have an environment that's conducive to learning. But driving a bus is hard. I just Driving a car down the road is difficult enough, dealing with all the traffic that's in front of you. But then to place 60, 70 children behind you, the behavior of those children is really important. And unfortunately, we've seen an increase of negative behavior on our buses which hurts job satisfaction for drivers, right? And, um, and creates unsafe situations, but it also creates situations where buses sometimes have to stop or turn around to deal with behavior, and then it puts all of the bus route behind for the, for the rest of the day. And so um, please talk to your students about their behavior on the buses. Uh, you know, we've reached that point, and, and I've had conversations with Mr. McCord with our assistant superintendents who have had those same conversations with our principals that uh, if students can't behave on the bus, then we have to remove that privilege, which we understand that that is a, a huge burden that that goes to the parents. If, you, they're, if your children's not able to ride the bus, if your children are unable to ride the bus, what that means for you. At the same time, we can't allow one child on the bus to create an unsafe situation for all children or cause that bus to never run on time. So um, I think it's just important, right? And I know the bus drivers feel the same way. They, it, they it, want kids to be safe, but they, they need them to behave and they deserve to be respected. It, well, it is, and it's all connected. And if, if, as I'm a bus driver, it's quite a challenge. And I'm driving one, through one of the best, if not the fastest growing counties in the state. I'm driving through traffic. I'm getting kids home, which is what my job is to do. And the behavior impacts the students on the bus all kinds of situations, the driver. So the, the bar is higher, but sometimes as a principal for two decades, you would see students, great kids, mm -hmm. but sometimes they would get on a bus and they would temporarily, temporarily lose sight of that. So as parents or guardians and my children rode the bus, anything you can do to reiterate that really is important and it's because it makes a difference. It makes a difference when the bus gets home, the satisfaction of everyone who's on the bus as they make that way home or to school. So just to back up, it's all connected, Dr. Yeah. Noel. And we've spent a lot of time this year, a lot of effort, not, not just time, but different resources investing and in trying to help our transportation system um, survive, really, right. in a situation where we've struggled to hire uh, folks and we've only kept it afloat because we have wonderful people. Uh, what, can you give us an update on our status? Where, where are we as far as how many drivers well, short? And <clears throat> right now we have, we're running about 380 routes every day. We have 20 vacancies. So we are hiring right now. And I've said on this uh, show before, really you have to salute the drivers, the regular route drivers, but also the standby drivers that you could also call substitute drivers, but also the mechanics that drive on a daily basis and the office staff. And over these last three years, through COVID and everything, ice storms and thick and thin and everything in between, you can't say enough about the office staff, the mechanics, and just how everyone pulls together every day to drive. And so we're continually hiring. We are offering paid training. We will help you get your CLP. We'll help you get your CDL. We will train you along the way and pay, pay you along the way to get it. And as we've remarked on this uh, uh, forum before, what really works best is having a dedicated driver that knows that route, mm -hmm. that knows the kids, knows the ge geography, situations, the parents. That is what is ideal. And so that is what we're constantly striving to do is to attract and retain drivers. 
Uh, we have one of the great school districts in Texas to work for, and so we continually try to do that in transportation. Yeah, so as part of this continuous improvement process that we've had in transportation, I think you joined me back in August, if I remember right, uh, and we talked about something that was coming in the future, and, yes, and then it, it was just so far out, you know, it was just, we were just talking about it hypothetically, but but it's here, and what I mean by it is smart tag. So smart tag is a new system that we have in place that has uh, many great benefits, and uh, and we're we're now in the middle of the rollout Correct. of smart tag. Can you give us the 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 brief explanation of what is smart tag? So what smart tag is? It's really a system for safety, and it's a system that allows for safety of students for us to make sure that we have accounted for that we're allowing students to get off at the right bus stop, whether it be in the morning or the afternoon, that the proper students are boarding a bus. It's a, it's a tool that I can have as a school principal that if I receive a question from a parent or guardian about where their child is or if they rode the bus or what bus stop they got off at, I can definitively now, whereas before for the last 130 years of Conroe ISD, I could not definitively tell them, mm -hmm. I can now. The smart tag, all it is, it is a tablet. And the tablet has a GPS. The only GPS okay. is in the tablet. All right. It is on the bus, it stays on the bus. And it, so we can track the buses. Each child in Conroe ISD, whether they ride the school bus or not, is in the process of soon to either have or they will be receiving a, a, a smart tag badge. It is an inert piece of plastic. It does not have a battery. It is just a piece of plastic. So kids are receiving those. We've rolled it out so far in two feeders. We started a third feeder today. They went this morning. It went swimmingly. Uh, they are going to be doing uh, on today. They're doing the first one in the third feeder. And then the last feeders will be rolled out soon. We've accelerated our process of rolling it out largely because it's been so successful. Once we formalize and finish the rollout, parents will be able to sign up and they will be able to track the history, the, bu the bus ridership history of their child. Wow. And that is something I, I might want to do as an uh, elementary parent, but even more so maybe as a secondary parent. Mm -hmm. But also what we're really excited about and what we're vetting and are preparing to turn on in the coming weeks is an ability as a parent that I can receive a notification wow. that the bus is arriving close to my home. Mm -hmm. My child will be exposed a less amount of time at the bus stop mm -hmm. to the heat, to the cold, to the rain. So having greater assurance of knowing when that bus is driving up, whether it be in the morning or the afternoon, that is something our parents have asked for for years. And so this is now a new day and age where we are on the precipice of being able to allow that to happen. I want to just circle back and, and please correct me if I get any of this wrong. So I'm a child, I have my ID tag, and it, once again, it's just embedded with a code. Um, it's not tracking the badge, there's no GPS in the badge, we're not tracking the child, but a child enters the school bus, they tap their badge on that yes. tablet, and so that's how the tablet knows that the child's on the bus. When they get off the bus, they tap it off. Yeah. That, so that's how they know. So when the kid uh, is now at home, there is no tracking of the child. There's never tracking of the child. We're tracking the bus, and the fact that they scanned on or off the bus is what would tell us if they're on the bus. So Smart Tag is something that we are very excited about. Uh, I commend you, our transportation department, on the rollout. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we rolled it out first in Oak Ridge. It, when we went to Grand Oaks, we, we're starting in the Woodlands feeder now. So we were working our way through all the feeders. If you want more information, I'm going to show you on our website where you can go, uh, where all the questions can be answered. And so we'll, we'll pull up here the Conroe ISD website. If you go over here to more, you can go to departments. And I'm going to try not to go so fast as to make everybody dizzy here, but we're going to work our way down. To transportation and on the Conroe ISD transportation you can see here we have an, a nice uh, orange button here for smart tag and uh, Mr. McCord you want to you want to share anything that about this uh, well, yes. website I'll it, let you navigate us through here you can see the letters that we have uh, posted on the website in PDF form as we've rolled it out it's worth noting our plan is next Wednesday uh, we are a week from this present this broadcast. We're going to uh, start in the Woodlands College Park feeder. If you scroll down, you can go to where fre the frequently asked questions, 
and we tried to think of every possible question there might be regarding uh, smart tag and answers are right there and we're hoping that that will help along the way. Thank you, Mr. McCord. Appreciate you being here today. As we shared back in December, we had started a process of consideration of a future bond uh, as we looked at the growth of the school district. And I want to update you uh, on where that status is today. So we have convened a bond committee here in Conroe ISD. And I want to share with you some information about the committee, their work, and how you can follow along uh, with the information that they're receiving. I'm going to share a little bit of that information with you tonight, um, but I'm going to show you where all of it is. So let's start with the committee. It's a large committee. 160 stakeholders uh, are part of this committee, and you can see that we've been very intentional about making sure that we have representation from all of our feeder zones across uh, the district, as well as parents from both pre-K students all the way up through high school uh, and in, as well as employees. So the purpose of that committee was to come together and consider our growth, uh, look at the needs of the district, and then ultimately to decide if a bond referendum is necessary. So as part of our second meeting that we just had, we actually had that committee vote and over 98% of the committee said yes we need to consider having a bond referendum in November. So our work continues with that committee. I wanna show you just the agenda uh, or the plans for each meeting uh, that the committee will see so you can follow along if you're interested. You can see the topic. So we are two meetings in. We've, had, we've done our general overview and the purpose of the committee. We've talked about some of the finances. We've looked at growth and construction costs and our financial capacity. And now moving forward, we're gonna talk about new construction and land uh, capacity additions uh, as well at our next meeting. And then as we move into March, we'll begin to look at renovations and master plans, uh, consideration of gyms and playground improvements for our elementary schools. Uh, also in March, safety and security and transportation needs, infrastructure needs. And then as we move down, uh, further on into April, we'll be looking at uh, some items like athletics, technology devices, uh, with the goal that the committee will create the package that they would bring forward to the board uh, by May 11th. So we will see um, how this process goes. And once again, I will show you exactly where you can go uh, to see all of the information. What I did uh, for this evening's presentation, I pulled just a few slides out of presentations that our bond committee has already seen. And uh, I'm gonna uh, share those with you now. So first, let's talk about growth. We've talked about growth over and over uh, here in Conroe ISD. Typically, we have grown 1,500 students per year. But in these last two years, that rate of growth has really accelerated. So you could see uh, 2,900 students last year, over 3,000 students this year, bringing our current enrollment uh, to over 71,000 students. So what does that look like going forward? Well, we had a demographic study that gave us an uh, indication of what the future looks like. And when you see that chart, you will see that in 10 years, we are anticipated to be close to 100,000 students. So here's that chart. The, they give us a moderate growth scenario, which is, which is represented by the dotted line, and then also a high growth scenario, uh, which is represented by the very top of that blue bar. So you can see in 10 years, we are anticipated to be somewhere between 98,000 and 120,000 uh, students. So that is significant growth. So now that we think about the growth, the committee also has to consider the financial impact, right? It's the same thing that happens in your family. You may have needs in your own family budget, but it's, you, it boils down to the question of what can you afford? And so we really have to look at the financial side of the school district as well. And we start by looking at the tax rate. Our school board has been really focused on uh, maintaining the lowest possible tax rate while also providing uh, for a top-notch educational experience for all students. And you can see that we've decreased our tax rate by over 16 cents in the last four years. So a significant decrease. And you can also see how we compare there uh, to school districts that we compete with. So KD, SciFair, Humble, Spring Branch, Klein, Fort Bend, uh, you can see we're 10 cents less than Fort Bend and uh, 23, 24 cents less than KD ISD uh, in our tax rate. So when you begin to consider a future bond and you see like, you know, 
if a future bond might impact our tax rate by two cents or three cents, uh, you can see that we would still have enjoyed already a, a very significant decrease uh, in our tax rate. We would still be much lower than any of our competitive school districts. Well, what is that tax rate? Well, this is a, a great uh, example of a way to consider the tax rate because the tax rate is actually made up of two different buckets. So there is the bucket that um, the, the state helps us with, uh, and that is what's called our maintenance and operations budget. What that really means is that's our yearly annual budget. That's the budget that pays our day-to-day -day expenses like salaries, benefits, supplies, utilities, just the, the annual budget. The gray side there is our debt service tax rate. That is the tax rate that pays for our mortgage payment on our buildings, pays, pays the payment on our bonds. That tax rate is at 26 cents uh, presently. It's important to note that the state of Texas offers zero assistance to us on this gray side of the chart. So the state of Texas pays no money into building buildings for us. It's not part of the funding formula. And they don't offer us a way for them to, uh, to provide grant funding or any of those things. Building new buildings is solely the responsibility of the local uh, community. So that, that's why we have bond elections. And what the bond election is, is asking you, the community, permission for us to sell bonds to build additional buildings. Well, let's talk about just how do we spend your money in Conroe IC. This is um, not really related to bond because it's the maintenance and operations side, but people always want to know, like, where does my tax dollar go? So here's a nice chart that you can look at uh, and see exactly how we spend each dollar in Conroe ISD. Instruction should be the main thing, and it is the main thing at 61 cents of every dollar. Uh, instructional and school leadership uh, after that, and then I won't read the whole chart to you, but you can see it here. Um, one thing that I would point out, general administration at two cents per dollar is well below uh, the state average. We try to be very efficient uh, on the administrative side. Now, I mentioned earlier how the bond committee was going to see almost $3 billion worth of need. That's a lot of need, a lot of money. The numbers are staggering. Um, so there are needs to build capital uh, improvements out there, you know, new buildings or additions. But there are other needs that will come in regardless of if we have a bond or pass a bond or not. And this chart will show you that uh, kind of briefly. Portable buildings are something that we spend a lot of money on here in Conroe ISD. As we grow for 3,000 students a year, uh, to buy portable buildings would be roughly $25 million a year. Technology needs, we have to invest in more technology, um, it, not only on devices, but it's all that infrastructure that's out there, 20 million a year. Uh, and then infrastructure for buildings, roofs, AC, heatings, overhauls, and then additional buses for all our new kids. So we have a $63 million need that, uh, exists for us annually if we don't have a bond. So that question comes, well, what if we don't do a bond? If we don't have bond funds to pay for these items, then we have to use maintenance and operations, the general budget, to pay for these items. So that would mean that there is less money available in that side of our accounting for raises, uh, teacher salaries, supplies, special programs, all the things that we um, currently enjoy out of our annual budget. So that's significant uh, in that we go through a bond process. Sometimes people will ask the question, well, you know, well, my, my kid's school's not getting anything. This doesn't even impact me. Any bond program in Conroe IC or, or, or wherever in any district affects, uh, impacts every child in that school district because it does play a role in all budgetary decisions that are made moving forward. So let's look at our bond history just briefly so you can know where we've been. Uh, and just like your family budget, there's the conversation about need and then there's the conversation about what you can afford, as we mentioned earlier. So in November of 2015, we had $800 million of need and we passed a $487 million bond. So we pushed some of that need down the road. We've done the same thing again in May of 19 as we had $1.4 billion worth of need and we, and we uh, failed 807 million. So we had to come back and we approved 653 million. So we pushed almost $800 million uh, to the future. 
now we've experienced uh, unbelievable inflation and now this exponential growth. So our needs have pushed up to $2.8 billion. It is the job of the bond committee and ultimately the school board to make a decision about what is it that we can afford moving forward. Now, if you go to our website, and I'll show you where this, all these things are, you can see um, the, the tax rate impact of certain amount of money. Roughly speaking, about $1.7 billion bond would be about three cents on the tax rate. So uh, that's something that they'll have to consider moving forward. Now, the numbers I mentioned are staggering. Right? We, we see this inflation, the numbers have, have really skyrocketed. One of the other things about numbers for us in Conroe ISD is we're surrounded by a lot of smaller districts. So our numbers often sound um, very inflated compared to other districts because we have such a large enrollment. So uh, I would share with you now just a comparison of other local school district bond referendums. And you can see uh, our neighbors in Splendora had a $201 million bond referendum. Uh, that they uh, were passed in November. And it was approximately $45,800 per student that was included. So for Conroe ISD, that would be like us doing a $3.4 billion bond with our uh, projected enrollment of 73,394 next year. Just another of our neighboring districts, Montgomery ISD, in May of 22, they passed a $327 million bond. And, and I understand that $327 million is a number that's easier to digest than any number that starts with a B. But at the same time, they only have 9,343 students. So at $35,000 per student, that would be like Conroe ISD doing a $2.6 billion bond. So our numbers are big because we are big. And I think that's part of what we all have to learn to digest as a community. So the bond committee is, has looked now at growth. They've looked at the financial impacts and they have told us, yes, we need to move forward with considering a bond uh, referendum. And so we will push forward with that, uh, with their guidance. But it always brings forward the question of, okay, so then what, what can we spend bond funds on? You know, we, we, should, we should put money in the bond for teacher raises. I agree completely that our staff deserves uh, any raise that we could possibly give them, especially in this environment uh, where teaching is hard and we are really working to try to get the best staff possible. But that's not one of the legal uses of bond funds. The law is very specific about what we can use bond funds for. So we have this handy chart uh, for you to take a look at. We can use bond funds for the construction and renovations of facilities. We can buy land, we can buy school buses and other vehicles. We can improve the safety and security in our buildings and we can uh, use bond funds to purchase technology. The things that we cannot use bond funds for are pay raises, stipends, or any type of bonuses to our employees or operating costs, meaning just annual budget expenditures like paying our utility bills, paying for supplies, fuel, insurance or building maintenance items. So we can do building renovations. Uh, that is an allowable use, but just regular uh, small maintenance items are not uh, an allowable use of bond funds. As mentioned a while ago, the distinction though is if bond funds are not available and you have to begin to use general operating money to purchase things that are allowable to be bought out of bond funds, then you don't have those same funds available in the operating budget to do all those other things mentioned. Salaries, pay raises, stipends, bonuses, utility bills, supplies, fuel, all of those things could be impacted because you're using general operating money uh, to pay for items that could have been purchased with bond funds. So that's a lot of information. I am so thankful for the 160 people that are serving on our bond committee. We are working them really hard. Um, and each meeting is about two and a half hours long and they hang in there. Uh, they, they, they're really focused on doing their homework, asking great questions. Uh, hopefully maybe you're seeing them post on social media and you're learning some information from them. But if you want to go and see exactly what they see, let me show you where you can go to see that. Once again, we go back to the Conroe ISD website right here. Um, at the very front, you see bond planning committee. Uh, I will click that. 
and here is their website. So once again, you go here, you can see a list of everybody that's on that that is on the bond committee. Here are some of the graphics, the three scenarios of growth that you saw uh, earlier this evening. You can see the full demographic study. So if you love numbers and you want to understand exactly how our community will grow, you can go and see the full demographic study. You can use it as you see fit. This is the communities to use. So if it would benefit your uh, your company or your business to have access to that and you can find it useful, you are welcome to use it. I just would give you one note of caution. It is 308 pages long. So. Please don't hit print on that unless you really mean it um, because it is long, but you can also see um, the, the presentation from the demographers there to the board. Uh, scrolling down, you'll see more information specifically about the bond planning committee, the dates that they're gonna meet. And then here at the very bottom, you can see by day the meeting. You can see the meeting agenda. You can then see any handouts or presentations that were made to the committee during that meeting and then minutes are updated uh, within a few days after the meeting as well so you can see exactly what happened. So uh, you can click on any of these and go to a PDF version of the presentation that was given. So this was the February 2nd overview. Here's February 8th. Once again, um, you can see all the things that they learned about. You have full access to their information and as we continue to build this into the future, uh, you'll see more and more. Our, our purpose here was to make sure that this bond process was as transparent as an, and as an inclusive as possible. That's why we have 160 members on the committee. That's why you as a general public have access to every single piece of information that they have access to, that we have access to. It is all there for you to see. We wanna make sure that as we go through this, that committee can make the best decision possible with your input, with their own great decision making and ultimately when they make a recommendation to the board that the board uh, feels like that they have all the information they need to eventually make a decision as to what would be placed on the ballot to go to the voters in November of 23. So we're gonna have a lot of opportunities in the future to talk about this bond. We'll come back with more updates to talk about the process, but I encourage you to not wait until November to start to learn about this. Um, we're making this very public now on purpose so that you can be on this journey with us through this so that we don't get to November and you feel like no one has told you and you haven't had time to ask your questions or do the homework that you need to do to be able to make your decision on how you would vote uh, in the bond. So we want you to be a part of it all along the way. Encourage you to go to the Conroe ISD Bond Planning Committee website uh, and learn more, engage in the process. Thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, we, we ran through very quickly uh, some great news, all the things going on. We focused back on safety and talked about transportation and our smart tag system. And now you know exactly where to access all the information about our bond planning committee uh, and to learn more about the future of our community and how we're growing uh, and how will we respond to that growth uh, and be ready for our future. So thank you for joining us tonight. Wish you all the very best and we will see you soon.